Okay, I think we shall start now. Uh, good evening, everyone. We hope you're doing well. Today we have an amazing honor to host Professor William Kalin. He was born in New York City. He studied chemistry and mathematics at Duke University and received his Doctor of Medicine degree uh, in 1982. He did his residency at Johns Hopkins University. In 2002, he became a professor at Harvard Medical School. Professor Kalin is known for his studies of tumor suppressor genes and proteins and for his role in identifying the molecular mechanisms that allow cells to sense and adapt to changes in oxygen levels. Currently, the Kalin Laboratory studies the functions of tumor suppressor proteins, including retinoblastoma protein and the homolog of the P53 tumor suppressor protein called P73. The laboratory uses a variety of molecular and cellular approaches to understand how mechanistically these proteins prevent tumor growth. One long-term goal of this work is to lay the foundation for novel anti-cancer strategies. For example, one could envision the development of drugs that will selectively kill cells that lack a particular tumor suppressor protein or which will mimic a particular biochemical activity normally performed by a tumor suppressor protein. His discoveries concerning cellular oxygen sensing mechanisms earned him a share of the 2019 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. We are excited to find out about his unlikely and nonlinear journey to Stockholm and why science is like fishing. Without further ado, we would like to start by asking Professor Kaylin how we should measure success. Well, hopefully it'll become apparent during my talk, but I think one of the great privileges in life is doing something you enjoy so much, you would do it even if you didn't need uh, the money. And uh, there are many things about being a scientist that I think are just a great uh, privilege. The joy of discovery, the joy of meeting fantastic colleagues and uh, young scientists uh, in training, etc. So hopefully that you'll get a flavor of that during uh, my talk. I'll try to pull up my first uh, slide. <clears throat> and let's see, you can see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay, let's get a laser here and let's see if we can make it green. We'll get very fancy. Okay, good. So you can see everything now and hear me all right? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Uh, so I was born in uh, 1957, uh, which I know is an unimaginably long uh, time ago. Uh, but of course, 1957 was significant for uh, many reasons, including uh, it was the year that uh, Sputnik was launched into space. So if I was going to describe my, my childhood, I would say I had devoted parents, but they didn't hover over me constantly to see what I was doing. Uh, sometimes in the United States, we refer to such parents as helicopter parents who are always hovering over their children. But my parents gave me some, some space and it gave me some free unstructured time and some time to get into mischief. Uh, I had great teachers, including uh, I'm sure many uh, women who today would be CEOs or doctors or lawyers because <clears throat> Even in the 60s, I'm sad to say that many women uh, in, in the United States were told that if they wanted a job, they could be a nurse or a, teach, a teacher or, or a nun, but uh, many doors were still closed to women, sadly enough, and I'm, I, 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 I'm, I feel guilty that I was the beneficiary of that fact because I'm sure, again, that many of my female teachers uh, might have been doing other things if they had been born a generation or two later. I already alluded to the fact that I had ample unstructured time and I had many toys that fostered an interest in science or engineering. I had a toy microscope, a chemistry set, a construction toys, one of which was called an erector set, electric race cars, electric trains, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this wasn't an accident. I mentioned Sputnik a moment ago, and of course that set off the space race, as well as to uh, heighten the, the Cold War tensions. And so many children in the 60s had uh, such uh, toys. Uh, and here, for example, is a picture of my uh, toy microscope that my mother gave me when I think it was nine or 10 years old. Uh, and again, as I said, Sputnik uh, gave rise to uh, the space race. 
Uh, this was sort of a defining moment in my childhood. So I'm four years old at this point where John F. Kennedy says, we'll, we'll put a man on the moon in a decade. And so uh, to be fair, uh, one of my heroes as a young boy was uh, Neil Armstrong, the first man to set foot on the moon. But if I was really being honest, uh, I, I would have been much more interested in being uh, Joe Namath, who was a football hero <clears throat> at the time. And I was at this point living in the New York City uh, area, and he was the quarterback for the New York uh, Jets. So if I had to summarize myself in high school, I would say I liked learning concepts and ideas. I, I liked objective subjects where there was a right answer and a wrong answer. Uh, and like most uh, young uh, boys, I especially like playing. Uh, I disliked or detested uh, simply memorizing facts and regurgitating them on exams. Uh, I didn't like particularly subjective subjects where it was up to the whims of the teacher whether I should get a good grade or not. And in general, I, I didn't like uh, studying, which goes back to me really liking to play uh, more than anything. Uh, now, before going further, uh, for those of you who don't know, the American grading system for many years was uh, as follows. An A was excellent. Uh, a B was good, but I put good in quotes because it really wasn't all that good. Uh, a C was satisfactory, D was unsatisfactory, and an F was a failure. So for most of my high school uh, years, uh, my first three years in high school, I, I got uh, Bs uh, more or less in everything, except for I did get A's in math, and that's partly because uh, math came very easily to me and I could get, I could get A's without actually studying. Uh, my, my mother was a very good mathematician. In fact, she was an actuary before she started raising a family. So I must have gotten her mathematics gene because uh, again, once you explained or told me a concept of mathematics, it was intuitively obvious. I knew how to apply it. Uh, I didn't have to study it again, again, my kind of subject. Uh, and you could prove whether you had the right or wrong uh, answer. Uh, and then something happened that sort of changed my life. So in 19... 74, my high school got a uh, one of the first uh, computer uh, terminals. Now I'll point out this was long before the development of the personal computer. So this was a computer terminal, which it, frankly was a glorified, modified uh, IBM typewriter that was hooked to a, a mainframe computer at a, a neighboring uh, university, Fairfield uh, University. And I, I became fascinated with computer science uh, this, it seemed to me, was sort of mathematics come to life. And I was just amazed at, at the power of this machine and the fact that you could get it to respond uh, to your command. So I became very interested in computer science. And then one day, and I remember it very well, in the waste paper bin next to the computer, there was a pamphlet for a summer program to be held at Florida Atlantic University. And this summer program was gonna invite 32 high school students from around the country who were gifted in mathematics or computer science to come study college level mathematics and computer science. And so sort of on a lark, I applied and happily I was admitted. Uh, and this summer changed uh, my life for a number of reasons. So uh, the first thing is that I had never been surrounded by such smart kids. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a truism is you, you just learn more and you grow faster when you're surrounded by people who are smarter and more talented than you are. Uh, secondly, I, I had never been exposed to such a stimulating and a, an interesting uh, curriculum. Uh, and I began to realize that my real problem in high school in hindsight was that I had been sort of bored in school because now I was pretty excited about uh, studying. Uh, and most importantly, uh, despite my low expectations of myself, it turned out uh, I could kind of hold my own with these uh, 31 other students, but all of them had much, much, much better grades back home than I did in their respective high schools. And, and that's because their study habits were much better than my study habits were, which wasn't really uh, saying all that much. 
So I decided for my senior year in high school, I would <coughs> excuse me, do a little experiment, which was uh, that rather than sitting in the back of the classroom and making fun of the smart kids, I would sit in the front of the classroom and actually try to be one of the smart kids. Uh, and I would actually bring my books home at night and do all my homework and actually even do the extra credit problems and do extra reading. And, uh, uh, and uh, suffice it to say, this worked very well. So uh, now my senior year, I got all A's and uh, A pluses. Uh, and back in those days, it's less true today, sadly, but back in those days, you could be a so-called late bloomer in high school, meaning someone who really only found themselves towards their junior or senior year and still get into a great uh, school. Uh, and so, oh, well, first, let me give you, I've already kind of alluded to this, but the, the one take home message here is to try to surround yourself with people who are smarter and more talented uh, than you are. Because again, this summer at Florida Atlantic University really uh, changed uh, my life in that regard. And it's been true ever since that whenever I'm given the opportunity, uh, I try to surround myself with people who are better, smarter than I am. And I should point out that might sound obvious, but you know we all have egos, and and of course it, it's good. It makes your ego feel good if you're always the smartest person in the room. But I can tell you, uh, if you're always the smartest person in the room, you should find another place to be because you're not going to learn nearly as much as you would if, if you were surrounded by people who challenged you. Uh, anyway, I started to say that back in those days, you could be a late bloomer and still get into a good school. Uh, so I think partly because of my uh, mathematics aptitude, I did get into uh, MIT and I was very uh, proud of that fact. But I should tell you, my father was the first uh, member of his family to go to college and he had gone to uh, Duke University uh, uh, and his dream was to send his eldest son, namely me, to uh, Duke University one day and for me to not have to do uh, a lot of the uh, terrible odd jobs he had had to do uh, in order to afford uh, going to college. So I told him that I, I thought I wanted to go to MIT and he put his drink down and he said, don't you have to be really good in math to go to MIT? And I said, yes, sir. So he said, I'm going to give you a math problem. If you go to MIT, uh, you'll pay your tuition. Uh, whereas if you go to Duke, I'll pay your tuition. And so uh, lo and behold, I did the math and quickly decided it would make more sense uh, to go to Duke. Here's my first uh, bill from Duke University. And true to his word, uh, my father uh, paid for my tuition. Uh, you can see this was some time ago uh, with inflation. Uh, of course, these numbers would be much uh, higher. Uh, now, in fairness, I was already starting to think that maybe uh, Duke wouldn't be such a bad choice because it had an excellent medical school. Uh, and I was starting to worry that maybe I wasn't cut out for a career in computer science. And I'll, again, I'll remind you, this is all before the development of the personal uh, computer. And, and most of the computer jobs I was aware of involved uh, writing code for uh, industrial applications or uh, military applications. And I didn't think that was too exciting uh, for me. So, uh, you know, now I have to start to pick a career path, you know, pick a career. And so certainly by the time I'm late in high school or starting college, you know, I told you I liked math and science. I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted new intellectual challenges every day. I liked interacting with people. I didn't want to be in some dark back room punching computer cards and writing computer code, which was my conception of what a life in computer science might have been like uh, way back when. Uh, I wanted a good income to support my future family, and I thought it would be nice to have a job where I could help others. And so these were some of the reasons why I started to pivot away from computer science and towards uh, medicine. Now, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I was actually doing very well with my new study habits. As you heard, I double majored in mathematics and chemistry. Uh, but uh, someone whispered in my ear that if I wanted to go to medical school, it would be a good idea to do an independent study project and work in a laboratory and show people that I have an interest in research. So I found a Duke chemistry professor 
who was willing to take me in. And he told me he had a project that seven previous undergraduates had worked on and all of them had gotten into medical school. And so this was all I needed to hear. This sounded like the golden ticket to get into uh, medical school. Uh, but if I was a little smarter, I might've said, well, why couldn't these seven people bring this project uh, to completion? And I became the eighth person who couldn't bring this project uh, to completion. Uh, I can now tell you with absolute certainty that this laboratory project was uninteresting, unimportant, uh, and undoable, although I didn't appreciate this when I was 17 uh, years old, uh, except that I did uh, correctly during my last lab meeting raise the concern that this project was based on an artifact of one of my predecessors and might never be uh, completed. Well, of course, this made my professor very uh, unhappy. Uh, and uh, here's my uh, transcript, at least from the relevant time that I'm at Duke. Uh, and you can see I'm a generally a pretty good student, but here for my first laboratory experience, uh, he gave me a C minus. Uh, I, I will tell you for years when I told this story, I thought he gave me a C plus, or at least that's what I told people. But then after the Nobel Prize, I pulled my transcript and I could see that he had actually given me a, a C minus, which was obviously so painful in my mind, I had sort of upgraded myself to a C plus. And then to add a further punitive flourish, he wrote in the margin of my transcript that Mr. Kalen appears to be a bright young man whose future lies outside uh, the laboratory. Uh, so this was the start of my research career. Uh, so the take home message here is if you're struggling in a laboratory, it might be your fault, or it might be that you're, you're in the wrong lab or you have the wrong project or you have the wrong uh, mentor. Uh, now, I'm sure partly because of this uh, C minus, I was rejected from my uh, current uh, home at Harvard Medical School. Uh, but I'm happy to report that I did get into a couple of medical schools, including Duke uh, Medical School. Uh, so uh, off I went to Duke uh, Medical School. You can almost tell it's the 70s from this uh, haircut. Uh, and one thing that really saved me at Duke was at Duke, they uh, compressed the first two years of classroom learning into the first year. And, and that was important because was a, at least in those days, there was a lot of rote memorization in medical school. And so the first year of medical school was pretty dull and painful, but I can do anything for a year. I'm not sure I could have done it for two years. Uh, but fortunately, in return, in your third year, you were encouraged to work in a laboratory and get some laboratory experience. And so with some fear and trepidation, I again set foot in a laboratory, uh, this time uh, studying tumor blood flow uh, using tumor bearing uh, rats. Uh, my mentor was Randy Jurdle, who was a radiation biologist. Here's my first paper. Uh, and I will tell you, this experience was uh, better than my first uh, laboratory experience. Uh, Randy was a very good mentor, a very good uh, uh, motivator, uh, very enthusiastic, and at least this project was uh, doable. And one thing I learned from this experience is that the most important thing for a young person entering the lab is to have something work within a reasonable uh, time frame, so that at least they have a little taste of success. Uh, you know, to see if they can sort of get get the, a sense of the thrill of working in a laboratory. And so I say is they have something to a first approximation anything uh, work. Uh, I, I still remember how excited I was the first time I cut a plasmid with a restriction enzyme and got the right number of fragments. I, I just thought this was uh, magical. Uh, the other thing to note here is that this is a paper about tumor blood flow. And, it, and this was a time when I started to learn more and more about tumor angiogenesis and tumor blood flow. And I've been struck over the years how many times I would learn something in one context and it would then pay dividends uh, years later in a different uh, context. So uh, despite this better laboratory experience, I was pretty convinced I was gonna be a clinical doctor. Uh, I went to Johns Hopkins, as you heard, to be an intern and resident. Here I am up here. Uh, my chairman when I was an intern was the great uh, Victor McCusick, 
Uh, here's another picture of me from internship. Now you can see it's probably the end of the year because all the white coats have come off, the ties are uh, loosened. Uh, so I think we're celebrating the end of the first year. But as I mentioned, my, my chairman was the great Victor McCusick, and he was one of the fathers of uh, modern human uh, clinical genetics. You're probably familiar with the, the book he created, uh, the, uh, which is now the on, online catalog of Mendelian inheritance in man. Uh, and he was also a real stickler for medical history and for understanding the contributions of the people who had uh, preceded you. Uh, and so I say it's important to have heroes and role models as you go along. And he was one of uh, many for me. Uh, I was so sure I was gonna be a clinical doctor. I stayed an extra year at Johns Hopkins to be one of the uh, four chief uh, medical residents. Uh, some people asked me, well, if you knew you were gonna wind up with a laboratory-based career, would you have done all of this extra clinical uh, training? Uh, and my answer would still be yes, because uh, it was a wonderful year. Uh, I, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I met my future wife and mother of my uh, children. And the, the other reason is it was during this year that I further honed my knowledge of rare, obscure uh, diseases, one of which is uh, now known as von Hippel-Lindau uh, disease, because uh, chief residents love rare so, uh, eponymous syndromes, because if anyone challenges their authority on rounds, uh, all they have to do is start asking them lots of questions about rare, obscure diseases that they've never heard about. Again, and, and certainly von Hippel-Lindau disease would have uh, uh, come under that uh, umbrella. And so here's the first, uh, or one of the first papers of what now uh, is called von Hippel-Lindau uh, disease. Uh, now, I went to Boston to do a medical oncology fellowship, uh, again, thinking I was going to be a clinical oncologist, but as part of my fellowship training, I was given the opportunity to work with the great late uh, David Livingston. Uh, uh, the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor gene had just been isolated by others, and David was trying to understand its biochemical uh, functions. And it was really David who taught me uh, to be a scientist and to think like a scientist. And he taught me many things, but one of course was the importance of asking important questions. Uh, and the other was to be your own worst critic and to design really penetrating experiments with uh, powerful positive and negative uh, controls. So why did I succeed as a postdoctoral fellow when I was such a failure in college? Uh, while I had truly great mentorship, David, I think, was one of the great scientists of his generation. I was finally given a truly great problem to work on. Everyone was interested in how the retinoblastoma gene uh, regulated cancer cell growth, it's, it being one of the first tumor suppressor genes to be identified. I was too naive, or maybe you'd even say too stupid, to know what should not work. And so I, I just tried lots of things, and some of them actually did work. Uh, and in some cases, I didn't know the classical ways to solve certain problems, so I just had to invent my own ways of uh, solving problems, and that's not such a bad thing either. Uh, good uh, doctors know how to multitask and to weigh conflicting data, and that's very useful in the laboratory, just as it is in the clinic. And most uh, doctors are trained to be careful, and again, that's once it's also important uh, in the laboratory. So now I start my own laboratory in 1992, <clears throat> and uh, this paper crosses my desk, which was the cloning of the gene that when mutated or altered gives rise to uh, von Hippel-Lindau uh, disease. And I thought, this looks like a tumor suppressor gene. I know something about how to study tumor suppressor genes having worked on RB. Uh, this might be a perfect thing for me uh, to work on. Uh, and I'm going to give you some of the other reasons why I thought this would be a good problem uh, to work on. So first of all, what is von Hippel-Lindau disease? It's a hereditary, uh, it presents as a hereditary cancer syndrome. It affects about one, one in 35,000 people worldwide. Uh, clinically, it appears autosomal dominant. Uh, that is to say, you can see it transmitted from generation to generation with about 50% of the uh, people in each generation affected. Although, as you'll see it, at, in a minute at the molecular level, it's actually due to a recessive mutation. 
The classical tumors seen in this disease are blood vessel tumors called hemangioblastomas, especially of the retina and uh, cerebellum and spinal cord, uh, the central nervous system, uh, clear cell renal cell carcinomas, and an adrenal gland tumor called pheochromocytomas. <coughs> And I hi highlight in red clear cell renal cell carcinoma because clear cell renal cell carcinoma is the most common form of kidney cancer. Uh, and kidney cancer is one of the 10 most common cancers in the developed world. And I thought everything else being equal, why not study a common cancer as opposed to an uncommon cancer? And so the hope was that by studying the VHL gene, we'd learn something about the pathogenesis of uh, kidney cancer. Uh, now just, again, I mentioned this a, a second ago, uh, although clinically this looks like it's an autosomal dominant, at the molecular level, it's actually recessive. So patients with VHL disease have inherited a defective VHL gene from mom or dad. So here schematically, I'm showing you the maternal and the paternal copies of chromosome three. The VHL gene lives on the short arm, that is to say 3P. Uh, but initially, uh, such patients are okay because they have a wild type allele that they got from the other parent. But unfortunately, if you're born like this, there's a 90% chance that some susceptible cell in your body, such as in the kidney or eye, will lose the remaining wild type allele. And that's the cell that can go on to form a tumor. And as you would predict from the knowledge that germline VHL mutations predispose to clear cell renal cell carcinoma. If you now look at non-hereditary or sporadic clear cell renal cell carcinomas, you again see that frequently both the maternal and the paternal uh, copies of the VHL gene have been mutated or lost. But here, uh, both of those mutational events or hits, if you will, have occurred somatically uh, in contrast to VHL disease where the first hit has occurred in the germline. Uh, now, another curiosity about these tumors seen in VHL disease is that they're very angiogenic. I knew this going back to my medical school training. And so on the left, I'm showing you an angiogram of a VHL patient who has a large retinal hemangioblastoma. And the patient's been injected with a fluorescein dye, and you can see this uh, vascular proliferation here. Uh, but less appreciated is the fact that kidney cancers are also very rich in blood vessels. In fact, prior to the availability of CAT scans and MRIs, uh, if you had a patient who was suspected of having a kidney cancer, you would do a renal angiogram and look for the characteristic appearance of new blood vessels uh, throughout uh, the kidney. So I also thought by studying the VHL gene, we would learn something about uh, angiogenesis, uh, which was of great interest in the 90s. People were wondering whether if you could block angiogenesis, maybe that would have an anti-tumor effect. Uh, and then I showed you this picture earlier. So I, I mentioned chief re residents uh, love rare eponymous syndromes, but they also like long, what are called differential diagnoses, which is the list of causes for any given symptom or sign, because again, you would memorize these things and then terrorize your trainees with your knowledge of them. Uh, so you might say, give me 12 causes of increased red blood cell uh, production. And of course, most people couldn't give you more than three or four. So here, here are the causes of excess red blood cell production, which, which uh, I'll remind you is the opposite of anemia, where you have too few red blood cells. So some of these conditions uh, are uh, things like life at high altitude or certain chronic heart and lung conditions where there's a problem with oxygen delivery. So here you could imagine the increased red blood cell production is actually adaptive. You're gonna increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Uh, but some of these things are, some of these causes are clearly maladaptive, including certain tumors that either produce erythropoietin or erythropoietic-like substances. And, and it had always struck me as odd that the three tumors seen in VHL disease make this list especially since the mangioblastomas and pheochromocytomas are otherwise uh, pretty rare. So taken together, uh, I knew from my clinical training that the BHL associated tumors uh, often are characterized by increased blood vessel formation. And we knew from the work of others, that's because they often overproduce vascular endothelial growth factor. 
And as I just told you, they occasionally stimulate red blood cell production. And that's because they sometimes ectopically produce erythropoietin. And uh, what VEGF and erythropoietin have in common is that they're normally induced by low oxygen or, or hypoxia. And so this suggested to me, there must be some critical link between the VHL protein and the ability to sense and respond to oxygen. And uh, I, I've read the biographies of certain Nobel laureates and I sometimes read about their experiments and, and I think, my God, they were absolute geniuses. Uh, my life would have been easier perhaps if I was a genius, but I'm not a genius. But if I got one thing right in this whole saga, it was this slide. And it goes back to something, again, David Livingston taught me, you know, it, it, all, all good experiments start with the question that you want to answer and framing the question properly. Uh, and so I think what I got right here was the appreciation that if we could study the VHL protein, we'd learn about oxygen sensing, we'd learn about angiogenesis, and we'd learn about certain cancers like kidney cancer. So we needed a model system where we could ask whether we were really on the right path. So Othan Eliopoulos took renal carcinoma cell lines that lacked the VHL protein or where the VHL protein was defective. And he then restored the function of the VHL protein by stable transfection, effectively uh, generating isogenic cells where the VHL protein was present or again, uh, functionally absent. And he grew the cells in chambers that had low oxygen or high oxygen and then measured the abundance of so-called hypoxia-inducible mRNA, such as the mRNA for vascular endothelial growth factor. So as expected, if the VHL protein was present, these transcripts only accumulated uh, to high levels under low oxygen conditions, hence their name. But in the VHL defective or absent cells, these cells produced high levels of these transcripts, whether oxygen was available or not. So this sort of confirmed our hunch that the VHL protein was required for oxygen uh, sensing. And in parallel, we did biochemical experiments that showed that the VHL protein binds to several other proteins, including a long in C, CUL2, and a long in B. And this turned out to be a big break in the story because uh, what I didn't tell you was the VHL protein doesn't really closely resemble any other uh, known proteins. And so we couldn't infer its likely uh, functions from looking at similar uh, protein. Uh, but as first noted by Steve Elledge, uh, a long in C looks like a yeast protein called SKIP1, and CUL2 looks like a yeast protein called CDC53. And these two proteins, when bound to a so-called F-box protein, generate a ubiquitin ligase complex that in the presence of, uh, uh, excuse me one second, I, I seem to have frozen. Oops. Okay. Uh, that th th these proteins, uh, when bound together, generate a so-called ubiquitin ligase complex that will target specific proteins for proteasomal degradation. Uh, now, strengthening this idea that the complex on the left was a ubiquitin ligase also, uh, we had shown that there were two hotspots for mutations uh, in the VHL protein, if you looked at VHL families around the world. One was the alpha domain, which recruited the rest of the complex. And the other was the beta domain, which our uh, collaborator, Nicola Pavletic, who solved this uh, protein structure, correctly predicted would be the substrate docking site. Uh, and so uh, the question then became, uh, what's the substrate for this putative ubiquitin uh, ligase? Now, I have to tell you one more thing before telling you the answer. I, I, you know, scientists sometimes refer to genes being on or off or expressed or not expressed. Uh, but when they say they're on or expressed, they mean that the, the, the gene is actually being used to produce mRNA copies, which is being used to drive the production of protein. And this is often under the control of uh, sequence specific DNA binding uh, transcription factors. Now we knew from the work of many laboratories, including the laboratories of my fellow laureates, uh, Greg Semenza and Sir Peter Ratcliffe, that many hypoxia inducible uh, genes such as VEGF and erythropoietin are under the control of a heterodimeric transcription factor called hypoxia inducible factor, or HIF for short, that contains, contains an unstable alpha subunit 
that's normally degraded if oxygen is plentiful, uh, and a constitutively stable beta subunit, which is sometimes uh, referred to by the alternative name of ARNT. And so our lab and several others went on to show that indeed, in the presence of oxygen, the VHL ubiquitin ligase binds directly to HIP alpha and targets it for proteasomal degradation, whereas if oxygen levels are low or the VHL protein has been mutated, such as happens, for example, frequently in kidney cancer, now HIF alpha can accumulate dimerize with its partner protein aren't and activate the transcription of genes such as VEGF. So as you hope happens in science, we had solved one riddle or one puzzle. Why do VHL defective kidney cancers overproduce hypoxia inducible uh, gene products such as VEGF and erythropoietin? But we had stumbled onto a, on one level more interesting and important question, which is how does the VHL protein know, if you will, whether oxygen is or is not available, and hence whether it should or should not interact with HIP alpha. And in work that we did, and Peter Ratcliffe did working in parallel, we showed that in the presence of oxygen, one of two prolyl residues in HIP alpha gets hydroxylated. And this then serves as the signal for the VHL protein uh, to bind. And I should point out, this had not been seen as an intracellular uh, signal in the past. In fact, the, the dogma was that prolyl hydroxylation only took place in the endoplasmic reticulum where it was involved in, for example, the maturation of collagen. Uh, now, I'm sorry, once again, I'm getting frozen here for a second. Now, the enzymes that do the work here are the EGLN, or sometimes also called the PHD prolyl hydroxylases. Uh, what they do is they split molecular oxygen and use one of the oxygen atoms to hydroxylate HIP alpha. These enzymes also require reduced iron, which explains why iron chelators, when added to cells in culture, can uh, simulate or a, a, a hypoxic response. And they also require a cofactor called 2-oxyglutarate, also called alpha-ketoglutarate, which gets decarboxylated to succinate during the hydroxylation reaction. Now, I should point out uh, that there were a lot of models at the time for how oxygen sensing would take place. And frankly, they were sort of inelegant and clunky, and in some cases, even contradictory. So the minute we understood this mechanism, you know, we were struck by how beautiful it was and simple and elegant, uh, which is all to say, had we seen something that had been seen before uh, no one would have been discussing a Nobel Prize. Uh, so we were delighted that, that the, the mechanism turned out to be uh, elegant and beautiful, uh, but that was a tribute to nature. That wasn't a tribute uh, to us, but uh, I was more than happy to be the beneficiary uh, of that fact. Now, what can we do about this? Well, first of all, it turns out you can inhibit these enzymes with chemicals that are competitive with respect to 2 oxyglutarate. And so when you inhibit th these enzymes, you'll upregulate HIF, you'll mimic a hypoxic response, and you turn on things like erythropoietin, causing an increase in red blood cell production. And I've worked for a number of years with one company amongst several that are developing such inhibitors. So I've been working with a company called Fibrogen which is developing a compound called roxadustat, and I should declare that I have a financial conflict of interest with respect to uh, roxadustat. Uh, but roxadustat is an orally available HIF stabilizer that's being used for the treatment of anemia, especially in the setting of chronic uh, kidney disease. Uh, these were the two phase three studies that were done in China. Uh, here I am in Beijing watching the uh, roxadustat being manufactured for the uh, Chinese market. Uh, and uh, currently, I think where we are is Roxidus that has been approved in China, Japan, South Korea, Chile, the EU. Uh, the FDA did not approve the drug in the United States. It sounds like they'd like to see one more uh, clinical uh, trial to address potential safety concerns related to patients who had very rapid correction of their anemia, which uh, appears to have been associated with an increased risk of uh, thrombosis. 
so again, because of my financial conflict of interest and because this is a nuanced discussion, that's probably all I should say uh, at this point about these uh, drugs. Now, how about returning to the role of VHL and HIF in cancer? So it turns out there are three HIF alpha genes, HIF1 alpha, HIF2 alpha, and HIF3 alpha. Uh, but our, our studies suggest strongly, as, do the work, as does the work of others, that at least in kidney cancer, and the rules might be quite different in other cancers, uh, the main problem is too much HIF2 alpha. HIF2 alpha is acting like an oncoprotein. If anything, to our surprise in kidney tumor models, HIF1 alpha seems to suppress tumor growth. And in fact, HIF1 alpha is on a region of chromosome 14Q that's frequently deleted in human kidney cancer. So we've known for some, some time that the real problem in BHL defective kidney cancers is you have too much HIF2 alpha. So what can we do about this? Well, uh, the conventional wisdom back in the 90s was you couldn't drug HIF, that being a DNA binding transcription factor, it lacked the right kinds of nooks or crannies or pockets to inhibit with a small molecule drug. But fortunately, a number of companies were already developing VEGF inhibitors. And we argued if these drugs were gonna work in any solid tumor, they would work best in uh, uh, kidney cancer because of this intimate link between VHL loss, upregulation of HIF and upregulation of VEGF. And I think we're now up to uh, eight VEGF inhibitors uh, approved in the United States for the treatment of uh, kidney cancer. Uh, so the good news is these drugs are clearly uh, very active uh, in the treatment of kidney cancer. Uh, and some patients uh, do well on these drugs for years. Uh, but the bad news is not every patient responds and virtually all patients with kidney cancer who go on these drugs will eventually uh, progress. So we have to do uh, better. Uh, having said that, and I, I won't read this entire letter, but I, I occasionally get letters from kidney cancer patients who uh, have been doing well on these VEGF inhibitors for many, many years. Here's a patient who in uh, two, uh, 2007 was basically told he had terminal metastatic uh, kidney cancer. And now he's saying I'm totally painless. Uh, and this, this, uh, this is an old letter, uh, but he, he did well for, he's done well for many, many years. He got to do many things he didn't think he could ever uh, do. He got to be the best man at his son's wedding. He got to see some more grandchildren born. Uh, he went to a baseball game and saw a no hitter. And uh, he's been doing well now for over 10 years. In fact, uh, when on the day the Nobel Prize was announced, he was so excited he came down to the Dana-Farber because he wanted to have his picture uh, taken with me. And, I, and by the way, I have his permission to show his picture here. Now that's VEGF inhibitors, but I think he would still argue based on first principles that, you know, you do better by targeting the master regulator. And based on what I told you, we should specifically target HIF2. Now, uh, I told you the conventional wisdom was that HIF2 was undruggable, but fortunately, Rick Bruick and Kevin Gardner, who were then at the University, University of Texas Southwestern, ignored that dogma. Uh, they identified a potentially druggable pocket in the HIF2 alpha pass B domain, which is what I'm showing you here. And they did uh, high throughput chemical screens and identified chemical scaffolds that could bind to this pocket and in so doing induce an allosteric change in HIF2 alpha such that it could no longer bind to its partner protein aren't and no longer bind to uh, DNA. Uh, and these compounds were then out licensed to a company called Peloton Therapeutics that was recently acquired by Merck. And the scientists at Peloton did classical medicinal chemistry to make these compounds more drug-like. They improved their potency, their specificity, and their bioavailability. And they were kind enough to provide us with a tool compound called PT2399 that was one or two atoms different from what was then uh, their lead compound. And, uh, and Chin Cho in my lab tested this compound uh, in preclinical models and showed that at uh, nanomolar, high nanomolar concentrations, it decreased HIF-dependent mRNAs, such as the VEGF mRNA, decreased prol proliferation in soft agar assays, and also decreased tumor growth uh, in nude mice graft assays. And I should point out, she went on to do a number of controls to show that these effects were really uh, specific and on target, namely were due specifically to downregulation of HIF2-alpha. 
Now, eventually, uh, this begat a compound called uh, MK6482, which is now known as belsodifan. Uh, and I should point out, I, I also have a financial conflict of interest with this compound as well. So uh, these are what are called swimmers plots. I think you can see why. Uh, so here, each horizontal bar is a patient with kidney cancer on this clinical trial and, and how long they were on the trial at the time of this analysis. So for orientation, here's one year on therapy. And all the patients with the black arrows were doing well on the drug, continuing on the drug at the time of this analysis. And the patients with the yellow stars had actually had a tumor shrinkage beyond a certain uh, threshold. And I should point out that uh, essentially all of these patients had failed at least one VEGF inhibitor, and most of them had failed at least one so-called immune checkpoint inhibitor. So these were heavily pretreated patients. So uh, you can see that it uh, looked like many of the patients were benefiting, and based on these data, this drug has gone into phase three trials in anticipation of eventual approval for the treatment of metastatic kidney cancer. But uh, some patients didn't respond, and we're trying to understand why uh, in the laboratory. Uh, but again, I would mention these were heavily pretreated patients, and we know uh, with previous rounds of therapy, you keep selecting for more and more aggressive uh, cancer cells and cancer cells that are more and more likely to be resistant to uh, therapy. Uh, now, a truism in medical oncology is most drugs work better in a frontline setting rather than in late stages of disease. Uh, and we've been aided by the fact that the VHL patients around the world are very well organized. They have their own uh, website and they can exchange information with one another, including about clinical trials. So we were able to convince uh, Peloton, and again, Peloton was acquired by Merck, to test this very same HIP2 inhibitor in patients with VHL disease who had never been treated uh, medically before. Uh, and to be on this trial, these patients had to have at least one measurable kidney tumor. And what we were sort of taking advantage of here was that these patients developed so many tumors that rather than continually taking them back to the operating room, they're often put in careful surveillance programs where they might get a CAT scan or MRI every three to four months. And only when a tumor starts to uh, grow beyond a certain threshold will they go back to surgery. And this is an attempt to delay or prevent the need for repeated uh, surgeries, which might otherwise leave them without enough functional uh, kidney. So here again, the vertical is one year on therapy. And now I think you could see uh, most of these patients look like they were doing well. Uh, here, the, again, the black arrows were patients still on therapy. And I think the green dots are the confirmed partial uh, responses. And uh, gratifyingly, uh, they, these patients could also have tumors of other organs, of other types, and some of those tumors responded as well. But if we just focus on the kidney tumors, 87% uh, had some measurable tumor shrinkage. 40% uh, had a confirmed partial response or a partial response that's awaiting independent confirmation. The median progression-free survival has not been reached. And again, responses were also seen in some of the blood vessel tumors of the central nervous system and retina and in some pancreatic neuroendocrine uh, tumors. Now, statistics can be a little bit dry. Uh, so just to kind of put a human face on this, uh, here's a post, many of the patients on the VHL trial were actually posting on social media that they were responding. And you can imagine these people have been living, uh, fearing this disease their entire life because they've seen it ravage their family generation after generation. And so uh, here's a patient saying, I never thought I'd see this day. And they're describing some of their tumors, either getting smaller, stabilizing, or in some cases disappearing uh, altogether. Uh, and since everyone likes a movie, I'll see if I can show you this movie. Hey, everybody, it's Justin. I just wanted to give you a quick update. I am in a gondola right now in uh, Taiwan. Over there is Taipei 101. Uh, the gondola is actually right by the Taipei Zoo. But I just wanted to give you a quick update and uh, say I'm doing well. I'm enjoying my trip. If it wasn't for the PT2977 drug trial, I would have never been able to come out here and do what I'm doing right now. Um, so I just want to thank Peloton and I hope Merck will fast track this drug for a VHL treatment. Um, so if you guys are listening, 
hopefully you guys will put it on the market to help VHL. But uh, yeah, keep uh, watching these videos. I'll be making more and I'll, I'll get better at it. And I have to get the angles right because I kind of look fat, you know? <laughs> I love that because I think at that age, you should be more concerned about whether you look fat on your vlog uh, than whether uh, your next CAT scan is gonna look so awful that your doctor's gonna tell you to get your uh, affairs in order. So uh, that needless to say was another patient on the trial. And again, I have his permission to show uh, his picture to you. Uh, so he did get his wish. So the FDA approved this drug and now it goes by the name Bilsetivan uh, this August for the treatment of von Hippel. Uh, Lindau disease. Uh, so in closing, uh, this sort of gives you a sense of how the world changed in the 90s with respect to the cloning and sequencing of uh, genes and the acquisition of genetic information. It just so happened the VHL gene was isolated in 1993. I think a number of cultures have sayings that can be translated to mean, may you live in interesting times. I think you can see that uh, if, if you were uh, interested in uh, sending rockets into space, maybe the 60s was a particularly exciting time. But I think if you were interested in biomedicine and, and genetics, you can see that this has been a pretty uh, interesting time uh, to live through. Uh, you know, I'm sometimes asked about uh, ha happiness uh, I was asked about happiness a little bit, or at least about success at the beginning. So uh, I had a professor in medical school tell me a long time ago uh, that there are two ways you can be happy in life. One is to pick a career you enjoy every day. That, that goes back to my earlier comments about having a job where you're having so much fun, you almost feel guilty if you get paid to do it. Uh, another is to pick a career that pays you well enough to enjoy your life outside of your work. Uh, fortunately, there are perhaps other models as well. Now, I will say when I was a clinical doctor, I, I, I found cl clinical medicine uh, interesting, and certainly it's a very, very noble profession, but I never felt guilty that people were paying me to do it. It was, it was hard work. And uh, the other thing I came to appreciate as a young clinician is that common things are common. So I was starting to see some of the same things over and over, and of course, uh, there are a lot of things that are interesting the first or second time you see them, but they're much less interesting the 20th time uh, you see them. And what I liked most about clinical medicine was solving interesting uh, puzzles. And so solving puzzles in the laboratory started to replace the joy I once had solving puzzles uh, in the clinic. Uh, why did I become a physician scientist? Well, I just mentioned I like solving interesting puzzles. I feel like I'm getting paid to have fun. Uh, I'm still my own boss. I can control my time to first approximation. Uh, I've met many brilliant uh, people and it occurred to me that I could potentially help more patients uh, through my laboratory work than when I was seeing uh, patients one at a time as a clinician. Uh, and just to give an example of meeting brilliant uh, people, uh, here's a picture of me again. I think this is in China in 2009. Uh, now I showed this picture to some high school students in Canada a few years ago. And I asked the students if anyone could tell me who this was. And after some hesitation, one student sheepishly raised their hand and said, is, is that Albert Einstein? Uh, which of course was painful on multiple uh, levels. Uh, but most of you may have guessed that uh, that's per that person was Jim uh, Watson which again, I think puts things back into perspective that we were really only beginning to understand the structure of DNA back in uh, the 50s. Uh, so uh, finally, I showed you this slide already. Uh, I talked about my childhood. I mentioned my microscope. Uh, when you uh, are uh, given the Nobel Prize, part of the ceremony is to go to the Nobel Museum and you make a donation uh, of things that were important to you. And so here is the microscope uh, that my uh, mother gave to me. Uh, and here is some of my doctor's equipment from when I was an intern and resident at Johns Hopkins. In fact, this is my Johns Hopkins uh, badge over here. And finally, why is science like fishing? Well, uh, if, uh, my father uh, loved to fish. And so I spent a lot of hours fishing uh, as a child. And uh, I think that there are many parallels. So the first is you have to, first learn some techniques. 
Uh, so, for example, in uh, fishing, you have to learn how to bait the hook and how to cast. Uh, and likewise, in science, you have to learn some techniques. But that, I, I thought that would be the hard part of science. That turns out to be the easiest part of science. Uh, I guarantee you, if you have a good protocol and the right person explaining a, an experimental technique to you, you can master that technique. Uh, so don't get overly focused on, on the techniques. Uh, second, picking a good problem to work on, like picking a good place to fish is really important. So this gets into sort of the sort of what I call scientific taste, scientific instincts. Uh, I mentioned, I think I got that part right, uh, knowing that working on, uh, on the VHL gene uh, put me in a good place to go fishing. Uh, and part of scientific instincts and taste, I think, is learned. Uh, and part of it you're born with, and I don't know the exact combination or contribution of those two things, but it's very clear if you're surrounded by people who have excellent scientific taste and, sec and, and excellent scientific intuition, yours will get better, which is another reason why you want to surround yourself by the best scientists you can find. And I was certainly very fortunate to have David Livingston as one of my uh, mentors, but I have also many, many wonderful colleagues at the Dana-Farber who have made me a better scientist as well. Uh, and then finally, and I think this has to be you know, re remember to put things in perspective. There is some luck involved in this business. Uh, you can be the best fisherman in the world, but on any given day, maybe you don't catch any fish. And conversely, sometimes a beginner will still catch a big, beautiful uh, fish through dumb luck. So uh, again, there is some luck involved in this business. If uh, the mechanism for oxygen sensing had turned out to be related to, for example, uh, threonine phosphorylation by yet another kinase. I don't think we would have been talking about uh, a Nobel Prize. Uh, so with that, I will thank you very, very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer uh, any uh, questions that you might uh, have. If I can stop sharing. If anyone has any questions, feel free like to type them in chat or unmute yourself. While... I just want to say to William Kellin, thank you for uh, this um, one hour. We have uh, something to listen, very good. Thank you, thank you. Very kind. Mio Dragojevic, uh, he put a hand up to ask something. Okay. Hello, good evening. It was a great talk. Thank you. Um, so so um, I'm working in cancer metastasis and I'm just giving a, a small background where I'm coming from. So when we uh, work on some cell culture models in vitro, there's always this story that, you know, the, the oxygen levels in incubator are too high compared to what is in the human body. So people talk about hyperoxy conditions and the actual true hypoxic in the body. So is this actually relevant? I mean, if you, well, if you make a discovery using these in vitro models, how, how much this is applicable to the body? And then you also have different organs with different levels of oxygen, like bone marrow would be very low and some organs would yeah. be very high. So how, how can you put some kind of bigger picture around this? Yeah, well, you bring up several important points and uh, let me... Uh address a couple of them in a way that might be helpful even for, for people who never think about oxygen and never think about metastasis. So the, the first is there, there's a saying, I think it was from the statistician Boxer, uh, I might have it wrong, uh, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So Everything we do in the laboratory, uh, I, in, to a first approximation, involves some compromises, uh, uh, some uh, in, in terms of faithfully and completely uh, replicating what we think happens in vivo in a human being. Uh, you know, whether it's certain assumptions about the media, the oxygen concentration, the pH, so that's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just to give a few examples. Uh, so that brings up then, I think, two very important points, which is, first of all, the importance of 
corroboration, having corroborating lines of evidence that get you to the same answer, precisely because every model has its deficiencies and in some ways might be compromised. So you feel better when you have a result or a conclusion that's based on multiple lines of experimentation that hopefully complement one another with respect to their potential flaws. And it also speaks to another important concept, uh, which is the concept of robustness, which is a word that gets misused a lot, but you know, the formal definition of robustness relates to the ability to withstand perturbations. And so, for example, commercial airplanes are designed to be very robust. The internet is designed to be uh, very robust. And so in biology, I'm always looking for uh, findings and results that are fairly robust, meaning that if something is only true under an extremely narrow set of experimental conditions, you know, it's only true with one or two cell lines, it's only true at pH 7.3, but not 7.4. Uh, it's only true at uh, oxygen of 10%, but not at oxygen of 20%. Uh, I, I start to get a little worried. And so I, I precisely, and now I'm gonna get a little more specific on your question, but I think in general, some ideas here are almost every model, I can come up with a reason why it might be misleading because certain compromises have been made to make the, the assay feasible. Uh, and it's why I think it's so important to be, uh, to be thinking about robustness and to think about corroborating lines of evidence. Now, to your more specific point, uh, my, my answer is often that uh, I let HIF do some of the work. So if I see HIF induced in a cell or a tissue, unless there's some other explanation, I assume it's because those cells think, or that tissue thinks, it's hypoxic. If I don't see HIF upregulated, I assume the cell thinks it's getting enough oxygen. So it is true in cell culture that for some assays, 21% oxygen is probably problematic. It probably is too high. It probably does create a certain amount of redox stress. But fortunately, a lot of things we study are quite robust and can still withstand the 21% oxygen. Uh, but for certain questions, you probably are, would be better off being, and Judy Campisi has argued this, you might be better off at being at three to 5% oxygen. But certainly by the time you get to one to 2% oxygen, you will be inducing uh, HIP. And I guess the final thing to say is, even though on one level, 21% oxygen is probably non-physiologic, uh, so is growing in a liquid that doesn't contain hemoglobin as a depot for oxygen. So, you know, I, I let HIF do some of the you know, talking for me. And I, I look at HIF to see if I think I'm in a range where the cell thinks it's hypoxic or not. Now, I, I understand sometimes that can be a little circular, but, you know, that's my way of normally thinking about it. Thank you. You're welcome. While we are waiting for further questions, I would like to ask, how do we learn to ask, you know, big picture questions? How do we learn to, you know, tackle the big problems, the important stuff? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. And, and while people may or may not be thinking of other questions, I will, I will uh, assure you that I, I don't have a photographic memory. So I won't remember your name. I won't think the question was silly. If it makes you feel better to have your camera turned off, I'm happy with that uh, too. But I, I won't remember you and I, and I bet it's, it turns out to be a, a good question. So this is, I think, one of the most important things uh, any scientist has to cope with. H how do I know I'm working on something uh, that's important enough, interesting enough to justify my efforts? So there's, there's no simple answer. I can only tell you some of the things that are helpful. As I said a moment ago, uh, I've been impressed when I've met great scientists over the years uh, they think very clearly and they're like a laser and they lock on to the big question 
and they don't get distracted by the little questions. They see the forest, they don't go right to one tree and start chipping away at the bark. They also can see the forest. And when they see the forest, they see the big question that that field is confronted with. So that's, I think that's a bit of scientific taste, a bit of scientific discipline. Uh, I think another benchmark is, uh, you know, if you say it out loud, it should, you should be able to describe what you do in a way that even if you were sitting next to a non-scientist on an airplane, you might be able to capture their imagination with what you're trying uh, to do. Uh, and, and so, you know, which I think, I think you wanna uh, be a little bit bold and a little bit audacious. And one way to know if you're being bold and audacious is if you have to walk in the closet and say out loud what it is you are gonna work on. You know, what is the question? Uh, because so often when you say it out loud, you might say, well, that, that sounds a bit pedestrian or a bit derivative or a bit uh, tangential. So it should almost sound a little audacious. And, and frankly, now I'm gonna let you all in on a secret. Now I was rejected multiple times from Harvard. I was rejected from Harvard College. I was rejected from Harvard Medical School and I was rejected from Harvard Residency. So uh, I didn't want to like Harvard as much as I, I wound up liking Harvard. Uh, but I've learned that Harvard has a couple secrets, but once you know the secrets, they're, they're no longer secrets. So Harvard is a great institution because it attracts great young people, but it attracts great young people because it's a great institution. So it's a positive feedback loop where you have lots of bright young minds uh, all coming together. But more importantly, uh, I think when people train at Harvard, they feel a little bit more self-confident they feel a little bit more entitled to do those big, bold, audacious experiments because after all, they went to Harvard, right? So why not me, I mean, right? So who's, who, who's more capable than me? And so I think part of the trick in science is you, you want enough self-doubt that you're careful and you're critical and you do those extra experiments, including those corroborating, you know, ob obtaining those corroborating lines of experiment. But at the same time, you have to have enough self-confidence that if you see the next big question, you say, why not me? Uh, assuming you can get access to the resources. Uh, I think that's part of the answer. And then I would also say, and I think this is very important for, uh, especially for young scientists. Uh, when I say, what's the question? I really mean, what's the biological question you're trying to answer? And you would be surprised how many people get so attracted to some of these new powerful technologies that, 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 that they're, they're driven by the technology and not by the questions. They just wanna do single cell RNA-seq. They just wanna do a, make, making a CAR T cell. You know, and, and there's no, now, now there's no real biological question. They just wanna embrace this technology. And I, I'm maybe a little old fashioned, but I would caution against that because technologies come and go and they, and they can be a bit of a fad. And you don't wanna go through your scientific career being a, a hammer that's always looking for a nail, you know, cause you've been taught how to do this one technique really well. It's much more fun, I think, as a scientist to always be looking out for the, that, that biological puzzle, that biological conundrum that you wanna now try to understand. Great, thank you. And one more question. What do you think is the stepping stone of, uh, of career uh, if you want to stay in academia? Is it like a PhD or a postdoc or is it different for everyone? Yeah, it, I, I, I suspect it may also differ uh, from country to country. So I wanna be a little cautious here. Uh, I think unfortunately, and I've written about this, uh, the amount of data that now goes into a published paper has increased dramatically from when I was a postdoc. And as a result, that's uh, made it harder or it takes more time to accrue the number of papers that you need to typically have to be competitive on, on the job market, especially for uh, academia. And so, uh, I, I think it would be hard given the, where the bar is currently 
for most people to go right from their PhD to being a successful independent academic investigator. Maybe some people could pull that off. Excuse me, one minute. Uh, excuse me one second. Uh, maybe some people can pull that off, but I, I, I think that's a big challenge. I think it's very, very uh, challenging these days. I think uh, with the amount of sophistication that goes into a paper, the number of experiments that go into a paper, I, I just think you're at a disadvantage if you haven't done a postdoc in a great uh, laboratory. But again, maybe I'm just a dinosaur and I, and I don't see the future coming. No, I'm sure it's a great advice. So thank you. And we have two more questions in chat. So I can read it out loud or you can, it's up to you. So the first one, uh, why is the occurrence of deletion of healthy copy of the uh, VHL gene so high? Uh, why is it? So, uh, well, that's a very good question. So the, the, the question is, is really, is, is it high in the sense it would be higher for the VHL gene than any other gene? Or is the answer that this is the spontaneous rate of losing a second copy of a gene, but in the absence of a positive selection, you don't see it. Uh, I suspect it's the latter. I, 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 my guess is, and I don't know if this is true, my guess is there's nothing special about the VHL gene uh, or the RB gene in terms of the frequency with which you lose the remaining copy. It's just that when you do lose the remaining copy, there's a, there's a phenotype you can easily score. Uh, and so for example, I thought they were gonna ask another uh, question which is somewhat related, which is why doesn't uh, VHL loss predispose you to lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, many other common cancers. So one explanation would be that the rate of loss of the remaining wild type allele is much lower in those tissues. I, I would bet money that's wrong, although I've been wrong before. Uh, my, my guess is from what we know in preclinical models, it's simply there's no selection for those cells. There's no growth advantage to those cells. Thank you. And we have another question from the chat and then we will go over to Oliveira. Uh, she has raised her hand. So Natalie asks, what advice would you give to a young future, to young future scientists who haven't yet decided on their research career? Okay, I'm sorry, could you, what advice would I give? Uh, what advice would you give to young, to young future scientists who haven't yet decided on their research career? So a, so one piece of advice, which I included in my lecture is at every opportunity, surround yourself by the smartest people you can, even if it makes you feel dumb. Uh, the second is, I think a good a sign that you're on the right path would be you're having some fun. Now, yes, are there some frustrations? Absolutely. You know, your, the, your gel leaked, your paper got rejected, uh, the, the experiment didn't turn out uh, the way you were hoping. So yes, there are those frustrations, but if you can take joy in the successes, uh, even the little, I, I, I always say, even the smallest successes in the laboratory, you shouldn't take for granted. Uh, and you should, but if you start to find that, you know, you can't wait to come into the lab the next day because you want to see how your experiment turned out, uh, then I think you're on a very good path. Uh, Embedded in the question might be an issue of, well, should I work in academia or should I work in biotech or should I work for a financial firm that invests in biotech? I think they're uh, temperamentally different people do better in different environments. So I, I sometimes uh, half jokingly say, you know, people in academia, uh, they, tend, they often tend to be like cats and it's sort of hard to organize them and they're, they're kind of loners and they want to do their own thing. Uh, uh, whereas in, in industry, you, you do have to kind of agree to be often part of a team and buy into a common vision of what the company is going to do. So maybe I don't know if that makes them more like dogs, uh, but there, there are different temperaments. Now I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying, uh, but some of it is your, te your temperament. I, I, when I've looked at jobs in industry, I just came to realize I didn't want a job where someone was going to hand me an index card every morning and tell me where I was going to be and what I was gonna be doing that week. So 
Uh, I, I like the, the the freedom of of academia, but it, you know it's, it's a longer uh, it's a longer discussion. But you know, find something that you enjoy, you find stimulating. Uh, again, you, you'll you'll have it right if you're having so much fun that uh, you would do it even if you didn't need uh, the money, and you're surrounded by good people, and you're learning something every day. Thank you. And now we can go to people who have raised their hands. Which person do we want? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, first of all, thank you for the lecture. It was very nice. Um, this is maybe a bit a naive question, but for example, going from PhD to a postdoc, if you would like to go to the States, uh, is it more about the papers you have published or the academic background itself. I mean, since you're working the, the PhD, you don't get to publish when you want, how you want. Right. It's, you understand what I mean? Yes, yes. So uh, when I, you know, I think when you're a postdoc, the, the currency of the realm, so to speak, is your ability to produce papers. Uh, whereas I think the focus in graduate school, even though it's, it's lovely to have papers, is still, you're really beginning to learn to think like a scientist and operate in the laboratory. So when I'm looking at postdoc applicants, uh, of course, it's lovely if the person's published a paper or two, especially if it's a journal I've heard of, but I also consider maybe even more, what institution are they coming from? Do I know their mentor? Uh, does this mentor have a track record of training successful uh, young scientists? And I'll, I'll tell you uh, another, it's not really a secret, but I'll tell you the other piece of good news is I, I think uh, you, you, you're still in great demand. I think if you, if you are willing to make the commitment to do a postdoctoral fellowship in the United States, you can find a good lab uh, that will accept you. It may not be your first or second choice, but you'll find a good lab uh, in which to do a postdoc. And I think that would be a marvelous uh, experience. Actually, it's not Serbia, but uh, I'll tell you a funny story. The first author on the paper that led to the Nobel Prize was uh, Mircea Ivan uh, from Romania. And he had gone from Romania to England to do his uh, PhD work. And then he happened to be at a, at a science meeting in the United States uh, and we were both late for the session. So we were both sitting on the steps eating a bucket of fried chicken that we had gotten, a Kentucky fried chicken, I'm embarrassed to say. And I started talking with him and he said he was a PhD student and he said he was about to start applying to do a postdoc and he was hoping to do a postdoc in the United States. And I said, I have a lab in the United States. Why don't you be my postdoc? So that's how, that's how Mircea Ivan came to work uh, in my lab. And uh, he came to Stockholm with me to help celebrate uh, the Nobel Prize. So I'm, I'm all for making an effort, if you can, to go to uh, a, a strong laboratory. It doesn't ha obviously have to be in the United States, but uh, I think uh, Boston and the San Francisco Bay Area are very, very strong places right now to do biomedical training. So that would be my advice. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, yeah. First of all, thank you so much for the amazing lecture. And I actually have two questions, if that's all right. The sure. first one is the more scientific one. You mentioned that in, in your trials, uh, I think the latest one with the newest drug you were developing, yes. you mentioned that VHL patients often have tumors in other organs. Yes. I'm sorry, as you mentioned, it is a bit of an obscure disease, so I'm not yes. very familiar with it. But my question would be, um, are there benign or and malignant tumors? Yes. Is it both kinds? It's both, and, it's both, yeah. and sorry, is it a potential avenue for further research? Because as you know, um, angiogenesis does play a role in the change from b b benign to malignant. Yes. So is that something you're working on perhaps? Yeah. Yes, so first of all, it is true that they can develop uh, a, a both benign and malignant tumors. In fact, the, the hemangioblastomas, those blood vessel tumors are technically benign. There's some other benign tumors we didn't talk about, but even in the kidney cancer, it's probable that they go through 
a state of dysplasia or pre-neoplasia before they become actual renal cell carcinomas. And there we do understand that uh, you need additional mutations involving other genes other than the VHL gene itself to go all the way to a kidney cancer. And so the VHL loss is the first step, if you will, but it's becoming pretty clear what the other genes are that have to be mutated over time to make uh, you a kidney cancer. Uh, so we're, we're only indirectly studying that in the sense that we're trying to make mouse models, better mouse models of VHL disease using uh, CRISPR, uh, bringing in various cooperating genetic events. You know, I think the angiogenesis might be part of it, but I, you know, I think VEGF gets upregulated the moment VHL is lost. So I think uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it might be necessary, but it's not sufficient for the conversion. You, you still need these additional genetic events. All right, yeah, it's much more clear now. Thank you. And the other question I was wondering, you mentioned you had a bit of a background in the clinic and I'm in graduate school. So I was wondering when you were talking about asking the right questions, yes. uh, do you still think it's important, as you mentioned, not getting carried away by the technologies and everything, yes, yes, yes. but yes. more of like having a, having a connection to the clinicians as researchers and actually uh, having more of a connection to the patients. Um, I'm not sure I phrased this well. No, no, I, 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 I get it. So let me say a couple of things. First of all, I think, uh, as I said, I think my, my clinical training, my clinical awareness was very helpful for me. I think clinical observations are a rich source of problems to work on in the laboratory. So it can only help to either get clinical training yourself or to have colleagues who have clinical training who can maybe uh, uh, help inform you in terms of certain puzzles or problems that they're confronting. And, and I should uh, also point out that, uh, I, you know, I've, I have met many PhDs over the years who, despite never going to medical school and never seeing patients have become pretty sophisticated clinically over time, just by reading and going to seminars and again, interacting with people who are clinicians. But the last thing I will say on this topic is having said all of that, I actually think there's too much pressure on young people to work on things that feel clinically relevant or feel like they could be applied. So I think it's great if you have a problem that does potentially lend itself eventually to a clinical application, but I don't, I don't think every, every laboratory in the world has to be working on something that's one or two steps removed from clinical application. I think uh, a lot of Nobel prizes were given for people who were just doing classical curiosity driven scientists studying uh, science, studying interesting and unexplained biological phenomena with no real thought at the time that it was going to lead to something applied or, or uh, practical. And all you have to do is look at, for example, the history of uh, CRISPR-based gene editing and go backwards, and you'll see a lot of wonderful uh, basic science, fundamental science, curiosity-driven science. And uh, you could say the same thing about almost every Nobel Prize. So. Uh, I, I think it's great to do things that are clinical, but I, I hope you don't feel like you have a gun to your head that you have to do things that are clinical. Just do great science. Easy enough said, yes? Thank you very much. We have one more hand left. Yes. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, sorry for not turning the camera. I'm watching on my computer, not laptop, so uh, I apologize. Um, I have one question. Um, I Right now, I find myself on the crossroad uh, between uh, choosing the science career or going into, let's say, computer science or programming. Uh, I have bachelor degree in biochemistry, and I was... Uh, uh, going to ask you for some advice on uh, 
I, I always been curious and I always been a person who likes to take challenges and to solve problems. Uh, but right now I, I'm not, uh, I'm having dilemma in my fit really to science. I mean, I've been a decent student and I always been uh, interesting in the science, various science and various topics. But uh, for me, it's like uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe the lack of the communication with the, with the or lack the, sorry, uh, the lack of knowing uh, the great people or the great or the or the science community, let's say, yeah. if you can understand. Yeah. So I'm having a, like dilemma. Can you do you have any advice or? Well, one of the hottest areas in biomedical research these days is computational biology. Uh, you know, I think uh, com computer science, uh, AI, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera, are, are a really hot area in biomedical research. And I don't know whether something, given your backgrounds, whether something in that space would be of interest uh, to you. Uh, certainly uh, in Boston, I, I'm, a, I'm an affiliate member at the, Bro at the Broad Institute, which was created by MIT and uh, Harvard. And, and they do a lot of this type of work. Uh, so um, maybe, but, but again, I come back to what I said before. I, you know, what makes the world go around is different people find different things interesting and find different things fun. So I, I can't tell you what you're gonna find is interesting and fun, but if you have that background uh, in mathematics, computer science, uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, this, this is really a very hot area in biomedical research. So maybe you could find your niche there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we have one more hand, Zoe. Uh, yes, hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us and giving an insight into your academic journey. So my question would be, do you think it is important to specialize in a specific research area of interest as soon as possible into your academic career or to maybe accumulate um, as much experience and knowledge in many areas as possible before you decide, or maybe- um, yeah, I don't, I don't think- yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't think you wanna, I don't think you wanna overly specialize too early. Now, I, I don't think this is a, a black or white hmm. thing. I think you can be successful if you do that. But the scientist I admire, um, have often had different experiences where they were exposed to different paradigms, different experimental approaches, different techniques, different ways of thinking, and then they blend them very effectively to take on big questions. And so as an example, I, the, one, the example I always give is biochemistry is really good at getting a mechanism, but it can't establish causality and it can't establish physiological relevance. Genetics is really good at establishing causality and physiological relevance, but it's, it's virtually blind when it comes to mechanism. But if you marry biochemistry and genetics, wow, uh -huh. you really start to understand things. That's just one example. So I like people who have been bold. We talked about being bold before in terms of the questions you ask, but I, I think also being a little bold in your training. You know, So if you were very, very, very comfortable in biochemistry, Maybe you go to a lab that does uh, informatics or, or, or genetics or mouse modeling or something just to see a, to see a different way of, of doing science. And then you get more comfortable blending different paradigms. Okay, because right now I have like um, this, also I'm at a crossroad because I, during my bachelor's, I kind of became fixated on the area of immunology and oncology. And I'm really interested in like translational um, research and immunotherapy and now I think oh maybe as a biochemist I should know about uh, metabolism more and bioinformatics but yeah. I don't know my heart is like with the immuno oncology field and I'm scared if I don't do all of it <laughs> I might might well obviously you can't do everything yeah <laughs> I would I would just say you know be, beware a little bit uh, following fads uh, Mm -hmm. Great. First of all, great training will never go out of style. 
Uh, so I, my first question is always, you know, who's, who's the mentor going to be? How, how good is the laboratory? And if it happens to be they're doing immuno-oncology, that, that's fine. But uh, <clears throat> I, think you, <clears throat> I think you also don't want to look back on your career and say everything I ever would have been, uh, ever done. Excuse me. I'm just speaking quickly because I have a pretty hard stop coming up. Uh, <clears throat> you don't want to look back on your career and say everything I ever did would have been done with or without me. So mm. you want to be in a position where occasionally you see things that others haven't seen and you've been trained in a way that, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. You, you've been trained in a way that you uh, feel comfortable tackling those big questions. I'm so sorry that I have a call at three that I have to jump on. Uh, I think we were scheduled to finish at three. Yes, we are. So I would like to thank you in the name of the Serbian Society for Molecular Biology and we wish you all the best. And thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you. Good luck to you all. Thank you all for your nice messages in, in the chat. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye.